Hello. So I wanted to come on here, long time no see, by the way. Um, but I wanted to talk about the Tyree Nichols situation and not so much the fact that he was beat by the police. You can see in my thumbnail, I used pictures of the officers that beat Rodney King and um, I juxtaposed them to these five officers that beat Tyree Nichols. So I'm not wanting to talk about his beating in and of itself. I want to talk about a mindset that we don't discuss. I feel like we discuss it in passing, but I think, you know, you guys know I love to put historical context on things. And so if you look at the picture on the screen, hey, you guys, if you look at the picture on the screen, what you're going to see are you're going to see slave drivers. And if you're not familiar with the term slave driver or whipping man, um, these are all terms used to describe slaves that helped keep order on the plantation. In fact, I'm about to read a few things to you which are disturbing to me. I, I find it difficult personally to accept this. Um, but when we talk about, remember Kanye West so controversially said slavery was a choice. And I said, I agreed with him. You guys know I'm not a Kanye West fan. I'm not trying to go there. Um, but I agreed with that statement. And I didn't give tons of context to why I agreed with the statement other than to say that rebellion was always an option. But I think when we consider the history of the slave driver, which I'm going to tie to the Tyree Nichols thing, just follow me here, then you'll see that slavery, in fact, was a choice. It was a choice. It was a decision that was made. I want to read you guys a little something. Um, I will be attaching the papers that I look at and links and, and resources to the description box when this live is over. It says, in the early morning hours, one day in May 1833 on a sugar plantation with the ironic French name, My Retirement, uh, or Ma Retirement, if <laughs> my French is really bad, a group of slaves was preparing to plant sugarcane under the supervision of their driver, right? Just Me said, there were a lot of rebellions, though, don't they count? I mean, I'm Gullah Geechee. My people participated in the longest slave rebellion in history, a rebellion that went on until slavery was actually abolished. Um, what I will say is they don't count when Black people were enslaved for hundreds of years. You follow what I'm saying? The fact that there were a handful of slaves every now and then, and then that engaged in violent rebellion does not count if the situation was able to persist. But more than that, if you follow me here, I'm about to show that slaves enabled slavery very literally because a lot of times, speaking of the slave drivers, there were no white people on the plantation. Throughout all of Slavania, Slavania is, you know, Slovenia is uh, not the country, but the word I'm using for the slave colonies, whether it be in the Indies or in the United States, Black people were often left to do the job of the white masters, hence what a slave driver is. So when you have no white people around, <laughs> and just plantations full of black people enforcing slavery for white people, well then my question becomes, back to you, doesn't that count, right? But let's get there. 
let's let's get there. <laughs> Allow me to get there with you, okay? Um Let's get there. All right. In the early morning hours, one day in May 1833, on a sugar plantation with the ironic French name, My Retirement, a group of slaves was preparing to plant sugarcane under the supervision of their driver. A punt loaded with cane shoots glide down the long canal that led to the field to be planted. Here, I'll share this with you guys so you guys can um, read it with me. <clears throat> the driver, an enslaved man named Franz, had ordered everyone in his gang to wait for the punt to reach them before taking their share of canes. Everyone obeyed except for Sam, who went to the punt before it reached the end of the canal, climbed aboard, and refused to leave. So here you have a slave driver managing the slaves and you have a slave that's saying, you know what? I'm not, I'm not doing this. All right. When Franz told him to, even worse, Sam dared Franz to strike him and threatened to hit back. Unfortunately for Sam, Franz prevailed in the struggle that ensued, a predictable outcome given driver's reputation for physical strength. Humiliated, Sam declared that Franz was not his master. Indeed, Franz was no one's master. But as a driver, he expected other slaves to respect or at least obey him. He responded to Sam's challenge by reporting him, he tattletold, to the plantation manager. The manager ordered Sam flogged and then reported to him that, uh, and then reported him to the civil magistrate for abusing the driver. Franz fragile authority was thus reestablished, at least until the next conflict. Drivers like Franz played a crucial role on West Indian plantations, in part because colonial authority was so thinly spread. Now, this is talking about the West Indies, but we're going to talk about the Americas too. White people did not find the West Indies hospitable. So most of the slaves in the West Indies had no white people overseeing them. It was black people overseeing slavery for white people. I want you to really think about this. Again, this is tying into the Tyree Nichols situation and the denial that black people have been in about what we are willing to do to each other, right? The head driver was, in the words of one West Indian planter, the most important, this is what a, a master of one of these plantations is saying, that slave drivers were the most important personage in the slave population and the life and soul of an estate. Drivers were especially important in black majority colonies like Barbies, where few Europeans were willing to endure the discomforts and uncertainty of life on the frontier of the British Empire, and where most planters were absentees who relied on a series of employees to run their plantations. On a typical Barbatian coffee plantation, for example, an absentee owner lived in Europe and thus hired a local attorney who lived in New Amsterdam to represent his interests. And they used a black slave driver on their colony. Now, these are people that are slaves, men specifically that are slaves. However, they are doing the job of the slave owner. What were the, what were, what was the full job description of a slave driver. And again, we're going to get to Tyree Nichols, but just take, walk down this path with me. Okay. Drivers collected information on field production. I'm going to actually read some letters that slave drivers wrote to their masters who were not on the plantation. So I'm giving you the background history, but we're going to hear it from the horse's mouth. 
right? We're going to read the words of an actual slave driver. Drivers collected information on field production, which they analyzed, interpreted, and passed on to the overseer, steward, or planter. In the absence of an overseer and often the owners, the driver had to schedule production and plan how to deploy limited resources. In fulfilling these diverse responsibilities, the slave driver was, this, was in this management capacity, right? And was a great example of intrapreneurship, not entrepreneurship, but intrapreneurship. Possessed both of practical and specialized knowledge of crop production, the slave driver could come to dominate field operations in the production of cotton, sugar, tobacco, and rice that brought the plantation dollars. The slave driver, James Pemberton, who managed Confederate President Jefferson Davis's Breerfield uh, Brier plantation, was representative of the slave driver as an entrepreneur. Slave drivers were both generalists and specialists in the performance of their management duties, but more than anything else, perhaps they had to be people managers, people meaning they had to manage the other slaves, who knew how to set goals and motivate the field laborers. Their expertise was invaluable in contributing to the agricultural product productivity of the antebellum South. Invaluable. Without the slave drivers, without Black people willing to act as the arm of the white overlord or white master, slavery could not be possible. Blacks so greatly outnumbered, they needed a Black hand. This makes me think of Margaret Sanger. Remember, she wanted to send a Black doctor trained by white people in because they felt that the Black doctor could handle the Black community better than sending in a white doctor because we trust and we listen to our own. We know that this quality in us has been exploited because we have the saying, all skin folk ain't kin folk, right? So we know that this is a weakness for us. Now, it goes on to say that the slave driver's expertise was invaluable in contributing to the agricultural productivity of Antebellum South, given the high rate of periodic absentee ownership, and that only 30% of plantations and farms had white overseers. Hear what I'm saying. 30%, meaning that 70% of plantations and farms did not have white overseers. They had slave drivers. 70% of plantations and farms with slaves were overseen by black people, not white overseers. Hear what I'm saying. Black people put in that work. Black people put in that work. Nobody put in that work for us, specifically Black men. Black women could also be slave drivers, but they were normally looking over children or very pregnant women. I want to read one more thing before we get to the slave narrative. Remember, I'm going to tie all this into Tyree, Tyree Nichols. It's coming around. We're just going to get there. All right. Planter compensation for the success. Okay, so we've talked about the fact that slave drivers basically ran the plantations. 70%. So we talked about the West Indies, where there were basically almost no white people, where the majority of the population was black. That was completely dependent on slave drivers because the land was not hospitable to white people. We've talked about the American plantation system in which 70% of the plantations and farms that had slaves did not have white overseers. They used black enslaved slave drivers. We talked about the job of the slave driver, how invaluable having a black person or two in some of these uh, slave driver writings because when the white master would be absentee, the slave drivers would have either written or um, they would write correspondence regularly, normally on a weekly basis to the owners about how things were going on the plantation, 
right? So we have discussed what their job was and what were the benefits of this? What were the benefits? Why would you do this, right? What comes to mind for me is like Thomas Sowell, Candace Owens, Jesse Lee Peterson. You know what I mean? These are the people that come to my mind. But let's keep going. So planter compensation for the success of slave drivers varied. High top leather boots. So they got, they got nice fits, great coats and top hats. In addition to the whip, were often symbols of the slave driver status and position. Since the drivers were seldom bred, opportunities existed for the slave driver to groom a promising son for this privileged position. Oh, I could do a whole series on modern day slave drivers. The grooming process. Thomas Sowell made a crazy, crazy uh, comment. He made a crazy comment um, about the Barbary slaves, right? He said that Blacks complaining about slavery and reparations, you guys know I'm not a fan of reparations. I, I don't believe in that mess. You know, but if you are on my members or Patreon page, you'll know today I released a video where I discuss my opinion on reparations. Although I have that, you know, video, the color of reparations is not green, right? So I'm not a proponent of reparations because there's no monetary amount, right? Go If you go to listen to my video, the color of reparations is not green and I go into it. However, if we are to discuss reparations, there's no way to deny that, that reparations are owed. It's just how you expect that payment is my take on it. But anyway... Thomas Sowell, he, he's talking about reparations. Remember, because he's, in my opinion, a modern day slave driver. And he brings up the Barbary slaves. I'm going to do a whole commentary on the Barbary slaves because, you know, and this is why I am a conservative, but this is why Republicans will never get a significant black base. Not that they want one. Because they say stupid things like white people were kept as slaves too. You know, because they do stuff like that. And then they bring out black people like, you know, Thomas Sowell and they they have him rant on about Barbary slavery. I'm going to do a whole video on that. I'm just going to debunk the whole thing. But suffice it to say, slave drivers were seldom bred. They were groomed. And Thomas Sowell has groomed a lot of modern day slave drivers. That's why I'm going to go in on him. Often the driver was rewarded with better housing and more abundant food rations. The position was also, uh, could also be used to mitigate punishment of family members and friends. It could also be abused to mete out punishment on enemies as well as to obtain sexual favors. Sometimes planters provided drivers with extra land for their personal use with permission to use other slaves to cultivate the plot. So they got to use slaves to cultivate their land. This is wild for me. Produce raised could be taken into town by the driver and sold for cash. Some drivers received money incentives in wages and bonuses amounting in some instances to hundreds of dollars for their efficiency in labor management and field production. And let's be clear, when we say labor management and field production, what they mean is managing other slaves and getting them to do the work that needed to be done on the plantation. And I want to reiterate that 70% of American plantations did not have white overseers. What they had were Black people, specifically Black men, because they had to be strong enough to make good on their threats. who did the work of the plantation. So what I'm about to take a look at with, and again, we're tying this to Tyree Nichols, five black men beating up another black man. I told you guys, I had a patron for many years, for a couple of years, maybe two, three years, a black man, and we would engage in conversations about power dynamics between white men, black men, and black women's expectations. 
oh, one day I want to be able to make these public. Not his name, but our conversations. And he said, and I've said this before, he never wanted to see Black men in power. As a Black man, he did not want to see other Black men in power. And he is more on the manosphere side of things, which was really fascinating to me that somebody more of a manosphere mindset, very pro-Black male, was not so pro-Black male that they would want to see Black men have control over anything. I found that very fascinating. That was really hard for me to accept. Hearing him say that, those conversations were very difficult. Very, very difficult. I would sometimes be talking to him and think, man, Cynthia would have a field day with these conversations. Like an absolute field day. It would validate everything that has ever come out of her mouth. Um, they were respectful conversations, but they were difficult conversations. Like it was, it was disheartening and saddening and frustrating to talk to him. It made me really sad. And I don't think if I were surrounded by people with that mentality, I, I don't think that my heart could take it. You know what I mean? I don't think my spirit could take it. I don't think I could maintain good balance in perspective if, if, if that were my only exposure, that type of mindset. All right, so let's keep going. It says, and so this is, uh, these are, if you didn't read, and I'll, I will attach all of this to the description box when this live is over. These are a slave driver, meaning a black, slave who is an overseer for a plantation and his correspondence back and forth with his master who's not on the plantation. So basically this master is gone for an extended period of time and he is basically keeping the slaves for his master. So they don't all just get up and leave. They don't all engage in a revolt. He keeps order and keeps everybody enslaved. And you have to wonder what's going through his mind and what's going through the mind of the people who, who you know, the slaves that, that are listening to him. Like what is going on on both sides? You have to really ask yourselves. And I know we're not supposed to do this, but you guys know on my channel, digging into the mentality of our people for those of us who are descendants of American slaves or enslaved persons, however you, you know, I don't like the word enslaved persons because that's just a slave. And it also indicates we had no power in this situation. And as you can tell, if we're, if we're keeping ourselves in slavery on behalf of white people, <laughs> clearly we had a choice. We just chose wrong. And, and it makes me want to talk about this because I really, do we have these mentalities today? I think so. I think that's what led to Tyree Nichols. I think that's what leads to Candace Owens. I think that's what leads to Jesse Lee Peterson. Who was the dude over on Fox? Who, uh, what was his name, you guys? He was just over on Fox News and he was talking about how he compared the five grown male officers beating another black man. He blamed that on the fact that the police chief was a woman and he compared uh, that to a single parent, female le led black household and that the black male officers were out of control. Oh, I got to do a whole commentary on that. The black male officers were out of control because it was like they were in a single parent household being overseen by this a black woman. He basically equated those five black officers to children in a single mother household. And because there was only a black woman to oversee them, they were out of control. He sat on Fox News. You got, who was that? Oh, thank you, Lorraine. <laughs> I said, sir, did you just call these grown men children? These grown men who have been fully raised and are out here with badges, beating up people, did you just compare them to children? And did you just compare, compare black women by proxy to the mothers of grown up black men? Did you just sit on Fox News and actually say that? And Tucker Carlson, who is the most ardent racist ever, this is why 
the, the, the Republicans can't go anywhere. Black conservatives should start a black conservative movement because honestly, we can never be Republicans because those people are totally out of pocket. Tucker Carlson had me on the freaking floor. This racist, he goes, man, you, you are always saying things that I've never even thought of before. <laughs> He's like, he, he said, you go hard. Jason, you go, you go harder than I could have ever imagined. <laughs> like you brought the racism. He was like, he was like Dave Chappelle. Jason Whitlock on Fox News was like Dave Chappelle. Remember when he did the black uh, white supremacist? And he said, big white noses, breathing all the white man's air. <laughs> Jason Whitlock went full white supremacist on us. That was the most amazing. I have to do a commentary on that. It's uh, anyway, the slave drivers. You get where I'm going with this. The slave drivers. They are the white man by proxy, the white racist by proxy, the white slave master by proxy. So with that said, let's get into <laughs> let's get into reading an actual slave driver. I, I am not going to read all of these letters. I went through, as you can see on the side here, and I put in uh, in yellow the parts of these letters that this slave driver wrote to his master as he was overseeing the other slaves, as he was keeping slavery going for this white master. Right? So he talks about punishing other slaves. We're getting to the Tyree Nichols thing. He talks about inflicting physical violence on the other slaves in service of the status quo. All right? He says, I have worked the people, but not out of reason. And I have whipped none without a cause. The persons whom I have corrected, I'm correcting his English, y'all. I will tell you their names and their faults. So he then starts to break down all the people that he's beaten up. Okay. <laughs> on behalf of the white master who's not on the plantation. Like this dude has been gone for a hot minute. So he's just beating up slaves and then reporting to the master via letter who he had to beat. He says, Suki. He had to beat Suki because uh, he sent Suki to plant some corn. This is a female slave that he beat. And after she had been there long enough, um, I'll, I'll read what he wrote. Who I put to plant some corn and after she had been there long enough to have been done, I went there and she hardly began it. I gave her some four or five licks over her clothes. I gave Isham, this is another slave, two licks over his clothes for covering up cotton with the plow. I put Frank, Isham, and Violi, Dinah, Jenny, and Eveline, and Charlotte, oh, he just started rattling off all these names, right? Uh, to sweeping cotton and going twice in a row. Um, and then because they didn't do enough work, basically, he didn't feel they had worked hard enough. He gave them each 10 licks naked. So he says upon their skins. So he took off their clothes and then he beat them with a whip um, with 10 licks a piece. Frank, Isham, Violi, uh, Dinah, Jenny, Evelyn, and Charlotte. He liked hitting on women, I can see, because most of these were women. Um, then he gave Julianne eight or 10 licks, he cannot remember, because she lost her hoe. She misplaced her hoe, so he, he whipped her eight or 10 times. And he said, and that was all the whipping I've done from the time that I pitched the crop until we commenced cutting oats. Um, yeah. And then, he said he had some issues out of Shadrach, Robert, and Armstead. And he said he threatened them. He said, I spoke these words to him. You do not intend to cut these oats. Um, you, don't, you do not intend to cut these oats until I whip every one of you. Shadrach didn't say anything to me, but Robert spoke these words saying that he knowed when he worked. I told him to shut his lips. 
He told him to shut his lips and if he spoke another word, he would whip him right off. But he spoke again the second time saying that he was not afraid of being whipped by no man. And I gave him the cut with a whip and then flung down his cradle and made an oath um, and said that he had as live, die as to live. I don't understand that. And he said he did not intend to stay here. So he was beating the dude because... He didn't feel he was doing the right amount of work. And the guy was basically like, I don't intend to be a slave, right? For much longer here. And then he tried to take the whip out of my hand, but I caught him fast by the collar and hold him. Then I told the other boys, so then he enlisted the help of other slaves to strip him and they done so. And then I whipped him until I thought that he was pretty good. All right. Now, all this whipping going. Now, mind you, there's not a white person on this plantation. I just want to throw this out there. All this whipping, he's got a slave saying, I'm not about to be a slave much longer. He wrestles him down, then enlists the help of some other black people to strip his clothes off. And then he beats him into submission. He doesn't even, you know, he gave the number of licks for all the other people. But for this guy, he just beat him until he thought he had broken it. Right. He goes on to say that because he is a preacher's child, it's possible he didn't beat him enough. He could have just tricked him into thinking that he was broken. Um, this is interesting to me because I want to repeat something. There are no white people on this plantation. Okay? There's no white people. There are no white men on this plantation. This is just a group of black people enforcing slavery while the master is gone. This is mind blowing. And remember, 70% of plantations in the United States operated this way, where the master could just go off, there was no white overseer, and it was just a bunch of slaves perpetuating slavery on themselves. Now, I don't know if you guys, you know, <laughs> are aware of this. <laughs> that this was going on. But that's why I said when Kanye West said slavery is a choice and I don't care for Kanye West or his music, he was right. I don't know if he had all this history or if he was just saying stuff to be saying it, you know, but it, you know, so, you know, uh, even a broken clock strikes, you know, is right two times a day as they say, right? Two times a day, even a broken clock is gonna be right. <sighs> He said, I do not know what this chat was to them. So here's the thing. He disapproves of people who disapprove of slavery. He talks about this twice. Um, Dr. Webb did not like the fact that he had practically beat, who was it, Shadrach? No, Robert. He did not like that Robert had been beaten to within an inch of his life. So, you know, once they beat a slave, they have to get the medical treatment because the slave is worth money. So Dr. Weeb sees what he's done to the other slave in the absence of any white people, right? And he says, I don't know what this chat was about, but he asked Dr. Weeb, what was good for a Negro that was whipped all about to death? And he had much to say about it. Dr. Weeb saw that this chat was calculated to encourage the people to rebel against me, right? So he felt that because a conversation was going on about how badly he had beat that slave in the presence of Dr. Weeb, that it was to get the other black people to rebel, which is something they should have been doing anyway. I mean, the minute that that white man left the plantation, the first thing that should have been on everybody's mind was rebellion. There's nobody there to stop you from leaving at that point. He ends this letter, this long letter with, believe me to be your servant. I felt like the believe me to be your servant energy, that believe me to be your servant energy was that was the sort of energy, that's the sort of energy that Jason Whitlock was giving. 
that's the sort of energy that Thomas Sowell was giving when he was bringing up uh, the Barbary slaves. That's the sort of energy that Candace Owens was giving when she said, you know, white, you know, white men are amazing because they both perpetuated and ended slavery. You know, that believe me to be your servant energy. That's how he closes his letter. Believe me to be your servant. I'm all about you, boss. You and what you've got going on. He goes on to say, I tries to pattern after you. Ooh, believe me to be your servant. And then in another letter, he closes with, I tries to pattern after you. I remain your servant. I try to do the work that you do. That's why Tucker Carlson, when he was talking to Jason Whitlock, he was like, man, you, you've said things that have not even come to my mind. Like you, Jason Whitlock was like, I tries to pattern after you, boss. I remain your servant. You know, because every once in a while, these slave drivers do have to severely bow the knee to prove. Now, again, this is all in the context of Tyree Nichols, right? We'll get there. We'll get there. Let's keep going. He said, believe me to be your servant. I just cannot. The last part of this I wanted to read was again his disdain for people. So there's a preacher, a preacher come because remember there's no there's no white people on this plantation. It's just a bunch of black people. So the preacher comes by, and the preacher has more sympathy for the plight of the slaves and this slave driver than the slave driver and the slaves have for themselves. So a preacher comes through. And so he's writing his master. The slave driver is writing his master. He's like, I know that this man is a preacher, but I don't think, you know, he behaves funny. That's the word that he uses. He says, let me see if I can find it on here. He says that the preacher behaves funny. Why does he think that the preacher behaves funny? He thinks that the preacher behaves, he said, I can't say that Mr. Taylor was not a Christian, but he act very comical the time he was with us, okay? Why did he think that he was a comical Christian? He said, I know that, sir, that Mr. Ta Taylor has done more harm among our people than he has done good, for he says that we are treated worse than any people in the world. And if there is any in the world treated any worse, he has never heard talk of them. And this he says he will tell to everybody that ask him anything about us. He has spoken very free about the matter. And Master John saw that he was doing more harm than he was doing good. And he turned him off. Listen to what I'm saying. He thought the preacher was acting funny and that he was being a troublemaker because he said, man, you black people on this plantation that are in slavery are being treated worse than anybody on the planet. And that's not OK. Does this not sound like the modern 2023 slave drivers to you? The minute you say that there's any injustice against black people, oh, no, no, that's not true. And that's how this slave driver was too. He's like, I know that he's supposed to be Christian. I know that he's supposed to be a preacher, but he's acting weird. He's out here talking about we're being treated badly, that no one in the world is treated worse than us. He's troublemaking <laughs> with this conversation. Right? So... How does this how does this tie into Tyree Nichols? You're probably saying, Irene, how you've talked about these slave drivers. How does this tie into Tyree Nichols? What on God's green earth does this have to do with Tyree Nichols? It's because 
because of Black Lives Matter, who, you know, honestly only cares about homosexuality and access to children, it's because police brutality was made about racism. It was made about white people doing stuff to Black people. We know that the police are just an extension, the police force is just an extension of the patty rollers. We know how the criminal justice system got started. The reality is there have always been, because in our community, we do not educate our own children. Shout out to the Zayx Institute and all of the parents there. Because in our community, we do not talk about the hierarchy of Negroes that historically have existed in our community and how there are certain classes of Negroes that we need to make our young people aware of that they don't fall into the trap of becoming that type of Black person. That when five Black men beat another Black man to death, so many people were in shock. And everybody had to change the narrative from racism to general police brutality. But the reality is there are slave drivers. That's the reality. The reality is there are slave drivers. There are slaves. There are people who have privileges. They have privileges because they're willing to put in the work. They're willing to put in the work. What, what was it that the slave driver said? He said, I tries to pattern after you. I remain your servant. Believe me to be your servant. Were those not his words? So when you have people, whether they be political commentators, such as Candace Owens and Thomas Sowell, whether they be police officers, such as the five officers that engage in this beating of this young man, slave drivers are a thing. There have always been a class of slave drivers. There have always been those that do not need a white master or overseer over them to do the work of the plantation. This has been going on since slavery, but because we don't talk about the ways in which we are used within our own oppression. Because we wanna chalk everything up to the white man's hand. We don't wanna have accountability within the black community about the things that we do to contribute to our own oppression. That is why I said, you know, in my video, there is only mediocrity. There is no oppression. There is mediocrity. Believe me to be your servant. I try to pattern myself after you. I remain your servant. This is the creed of the slave driver in their own words. So when we see this behavior, if anything, it is embarrassing to us as a community. And it gave fodder, it gave fodder to those white Republicans to say, see, police brutality is not a racist thing. It's not a racist thing. Because the Blacks will do unto themselves the same thing that they claim we do unto them. That's why they're always claiming Black-on-Black -black crime. Because the Blacks will do unto themselves the same thing that we do unto them. They've been doing it since slavery days. There have been slave drivers since slavery. So maybe the conversation we need to have is about the slave driver. Uh, Matthew 516, can I leave the sources in the description? Yes, I always leave my sources. I will attach all the sources that I used and I will attach some additional reading sources for you guys if you're interested in this topic. But I just wanted to 
give a different take on this, right? My take on it is slave driver mentality. You guys know if you go to my power playlist, I go into a lot of slave narratives because my question is always, are we operating from the same mental space today? Is this the space that we are, is this the space that we are operating from today? Are we victim to this today? And I would have to say yes. So I'm not surprised that these five officers beat that, that, that kid to death. I'm not surprised that Tyree Nichols got beat to death. I'm not surprised. You guys know that one of my favorite books and my, one of the things I like to recommend to you guys to read is the book, Black on Black Violence. Self-annihilation in service of white domination. Read the book. Self-annihilation in service of white domination. We've been doing this since the slave colonies. There have always been a slave driver class. But we refuse to look at slavery because it's uncomfortable and da da da. We need to really get into reading the words of our ancestors. Wrapping our minds around the kinds of mentalities they have and training our young people and ourselves to beware of the historical roles that we naturally fall into. You guys know when I talked about uh, the Patty Riders or the, I mean, the Circus Riders. Remember when I did that narrative and we talked about the Circus Riders, Black men that were taken from plantation to plantation just to have sex with women? And how in modern day, in hip hop culture and rap culture, this hyper promiscuity is pushed to black men. The more vagina, the better. The more women you see, the better. And how it is a circuit rider mentality, except for nobody's putting you in a horse drawn carriage or a cage or whatever they move those people around in, making you walk chained up from plantation to plantation to have sex with black women. But the circuit writer mentality is still there. Just like, just like the slave driver mentality is still there. But if we refuse to analyze our history and how we have engaged in behaviors historically, then we can't have meaningful conversations about why five black men would get together and beat someone that is of their own to death. Until we look at a slave narrative about a slave who did beat another slave to within an inch of his life, and then he called upon other slaves to strip his clothes for him with no white man around, with no master on the plantation, this is the choice they made themselves. And isn't it funny that we just read a narrative of a slave who did basically the same thing that those five guys did. They needed no white overseer. They needed no white overseer because as that man said, I tries to pattern after you. I remain your servant. Believe me to be your servant. Like I said, it's the mantra of the slave driver. I'll talk to you guys later. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section.